Okay, we'll try that again. Thank you. Great, if you could close the back door, I think we're gonna get started. Hi everybody, my name's Lee Sobel. I'm the director of the Public Strategies Group for RCLCO, or National Real Estate and Economic Firm. I'm also on the board of CNU National, and I'm a co-founder and current board member of CNUDC's chapter. So um, I'm very happy to be here. This is a session that's near, dear, and a uh, long time effort of mine. Uh, so it's a great topic. Um, we have a great panel, um, friends and colleagues today who are gonna present their information regarding the demand for walkable places, which I'm excited to do it. I think Gene and I have done this once before. Chris and I, I think, have done this four or five times before. Uh, and I'm really excited that the Sonori Institute will be here today um, with Jillian's information, which is um, actually information that I've cited myself. So that's why I'm very excited that she's here. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then I'm going to say a couple of opening remarks because um, our group was thinking about some things during the uh, some conference calls we had and planning the session. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the evolution of walkable places and the demand drivers, both in the past and and I went so far as to jump ahead into 2020. So um, I'd like to share my thoughts with you and maybe we can talk about that at the end of the session during Q&A. So Christopher Coos is the executive director for LOCUS. It is a uh, advocacy group for uh, real estate developers, both large and small infill around the country. Um, and they are, a group of smart, uh, they are a group within Smart Growth America in, based in Washington, D.C. Jillian Sutherland is the Economic and Community Development Project Manager for the Sonoran Institute's Rocky Mountain Program. Her work focuses on helping communities across the Rocky Mountain West deal with issues related to growth and change. She holds a master's degree in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois in Chicago and a bachelor's degree in sociology from Wheaton College. Outside the office, she enjoys exploring many trails on the Roaring Fork Valley with her husband. And Jean, Jean Anthony is the project advisor with AARP's Education and Outreach Department. She is part of the Livable Communities team where her work focuses on supporting the effort of communities to become great places for all ages. She develops strategies and resources which are designed to help communities per, to provide features such as safe, walkable streets, better housing and transportation options, access to key services, and opportunities for older residents to participate in community activities. So one of the things I wanted to do, um, I'm not really presenting the way they are, is I thought I'd set a, a framework and talk about uh, the demand drivers and the evolution of walkable places very quickly. It's five things. Um, in the 70s and 80s, what we were really focusing on, and, and it wasn't a formal focus at all, I, I think is urban infill. And the, there was really, the demand there was to preserve architecturally significant buildings. Uh, the other d demand driver, I thought, to myself while I was writing this up was there was a real counterculture movement. The people who were coming to cities in the 70s and 80s were those people who really had no interest in keeping up with the Joneses. They were counterculture people who were doing their own thing. Um, there was no demand analysis of who these people were, but we identified that people were doing this and we called them risk oblivious, pioneers, first movers, visionaries. A couple years before, we called them hippies, which quite frankly are the boomers today, and that will become relevant in my 2020 piece. And then in the 80s and the 90s, we actually started seeing the creation of new urban places, TNDs, traditional neighborhood developments that the Congress for New Urbanism put into place and, and worked very hard to get off the ground. And here, these walkable places, had the primary demand driver was residential. The market economics were still very unclear of who would live and move into a brand new urban place. Uh, CNU's Zimmerman Volk began doing consumer segmentation. Tony Nellison's firm began doing consumer preference surveys. Um, and we saw proliferation of traditional neighborhood development. By the 90s, we started seeing mixed-use projects. Um, the market economics were still very unclear, and there's an evolution of sort of MEMS. Very risky, too hard to do, and then live, work, play. It all got branded nicely, and people were able to move forward. 
um, there was a reliance on conventional retail and real estate economics to help figure out what retailers would move into a town center, a mixed-use project. And uh, again, CNU's Bob Gibbs you know, began doing a lot of real estate surveys and sort of taking the lead on that and helping us all understand who would come to these walkable places. In the 2000s, we started to see growth in two areas, transit-oriented development and the preference for urban living as a whole. And we started to also see a, a, a growth and evolution in demand analytics and people started doing surveys about who actually wanted to live in our urban places, in our residential places, in our transit-oriented places. And we found that about a third of the people wanted to live in an urban setting. The demand drivers here were transportation benefits and urban lifestyle benefits of biking, walking, you know, being, being in an urban place. And we began having precise data to quantify demand, absorption, development programs, and real specific use land allocations. And this was great. And so demand, um, was very consistent. As people were looking to see who wanted walkable places, academic trade organizations, ULI, the Realtors, NAHB, that's the National Association for Home Builders, Pew, Brookings, all pretty much found that most people consistently would like, at, at the level of a third, would consider living in a compact walkable place. In the 2010s, primarily because of the recession, we started to see, when we saw development occur, office-driven walkable places. And this was due to communities' desire for jobs. But it was also because employers were recognizing that they had to be close to workers if they were going to recruit and retain them. The second, um, the second area in the 2000s that I think we see for the demand for walkable places in is, is in existing communities where there's uh, land constraints. And in this case, one of the demand drivers is the fact that they've exhausted every other option. Um, cities have boundaries that are becoming out of land, the high infrastructure costs to implement or maintain, and then the risk of losing their comp competitive edge to other communities which are working on walkable places. And the other demand driver here in these community land constraints areas is that some communities have finally gotten it. Um, they understand the market trends and consumer preferences. They've examined the economic benefits and the health benefits. And they understand that there's a competitive advantage with regard to economic development. And the early adopters are seeing benefits to that that others have finally woken up to. So now I'm going into the future. So this is you know, great for a discussion you know, as a group later on. But as I look to what are the demand drivers for walkable places in the future, it really came down to one thing for me, and that was open space, and the, and the idea of having authentic, sort of experiential, social use places. I thought about this for two reasons. One, the millennials have completely grown up in a world of lifestyle centers, entertainment centers, mixed use projects, and hybrids, and urban places, real urban places, and they truly have a desire for authenticity. And the other uh, reason that made me start thinking about open space as a demand driver for walkable places are the baby boomers, the old hippies I mentioned a couple minutes ago who really either never left urban areas or those who are now coming back to urban areas. And they have a real need, which I'm not getting into your presentation at all, Gene Anthony, but you know, they have the discretionary income, they have leisure time, they have social time before work and after work. Yes, they still work and they will continue working. And they want to just have enjoyment and enjoy the quality of life. So Without further ado, I've sort of hoped I've set a framework, a, a framework and a foundation for our panel to talk about the specific niche drivers that um, are creating walkable places. And I'll let them talk about uh, demand across the nation in major cities, small towns, and rural places, and what older Americans are considering when they think about the demand for walkable places. So thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Christopher Coos. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction. Uh, I'm just going to make sure. Oh, perfect. What's up? Um, again, I'm Christopher Coase, director of Locus. We are a national coalition of real estate developers and investors uh, who advocate uh, for smart growth real estate across the country. Uh, as Lee pointed out, we represent some of the largest uh, transit-oriented developers that you may know, like uh, Forest City, uh, who is a national TOD uh, firm, or the smallest, like your very own Robert Davis with uh, Seaside and Arcadia Land. Of course, I think many of you know my president, Chris Leinberger, who I believe yesterday delivered the plenary. So we have been in existence for about uh, four or five years, primarily providing the private sector voice on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., uh, encouraging members of Congress, as well as the administration, 
Commission um, to realign federal policy, whether it's transportation, tax reform, housing, finance, realign a lot of these federal programs and policies to meet the current market demand uh, for walkable urban places. Um, today, I'm actually here to speak on essentially what we view as the rise of walkable urban development and the role that is playing within the top 30 U.S. metropolitan areas. Um, and I, I like to always start my conversations on, and I think, Lee, you kind of did it in a great way, how do we get here, where we've been, and where we're going? And generally speaking, we all know that transportation drives development, right? Um, we also know that for the past 60 years, uh, the shift towards drivable suburban development has shaped many land use and transportation decisions away from pedestrian-friendly development in our metropolitan areas. And I always like to show that, just to remind us what that, those decisions were like. Um, many of these projects and many of these decisions created unwelcoming, uh, and in this case, uh, lack of common sense in many cases, um, although I do like to say this is a sidewalk to nowhere, uh, unless that's a famous tree, or my favorite, um, <clears throat> really kind of goes to the heart of, you know, this crystallizes with the idea of going uh, out for a walk with your dog in your car. Um, but again, we recognize that this trend has lasted over 60 years. Um, but I know, and I know as Lee pointed out and the other panelists will talk about this, uh, the market has changed. Um, starting in the mid-1990s, uh, we begin to see a structural shift in how America be has been and uh, continues to invest in the built environment. One of the primary reasons uh, for this major shift towards walkable urban places, and I have to say it for all of us, uh, those of us who are under the age of 37, is the millennials, uh, as seen on TV. Um, I think one of the things I want to remind folks is that Hollywood spends billions of dollars in consumer research. Uh, for those of you who may consider yourselves, uh, you know, gray hairs, uh, you may remember I Love Lucy, growing up with uh, Leave It to Beaver. But today's generation grew up with things like, with shows like Friends and Sex in the City, or even now Modern Day Family, or the most luxurious show of all time, Scandal. Um, you get this opportunity where many of the communities today that you're watching, whether it's in movies or on television, are all in great walkable urban places, whether it's in major cities or even small Main Street communities. In addition, we also recognize that one of the major drivers for walkable urban demand is the fact that today, 64% uh, of college-educated professionals between the ages of 25 and 35 look for a job after they choose a place. Many of you who are, you know, uh, who have graduated many, many years ago may recall that you picked your job. You found a job first, wherever it was, and that's where you moved. But for today, today's generation, it's generally finding the places that have great live, work, places that really are just cool. And then once you go there, you're figuring it out. And so we're entering in a new market dynamic of uh, that's something that we haven't seen in a long time. Now, of course, there are other reasons uh, for this demand for walkable urban places. Of course, there are baby boomers who are retiring, as Lee pointed out before. Um, one of the major aspects is the fact that households uh, will be without, ch more households will be without children uh, over the next 20 years than what we seen, um, have seen today and even 50 years ago. We cannot uh, uh, discount the fact that if you lived in suburban um, life for 20 plus years, uh, you get kind of bored. Uh, if that's all you've been living and all you've been doing, boredom has a major impact um, on, on, on the consumer trend that we're seeing. And last but not least, uh, last two, of course, is the fact that the creative class, the knowledge economy, the point I was making before, if you're a Google engineer, one day you're living in Seattle, you may get a phone call that says you have to move uh, to Washington, D.C. or Atlanta. And so the idea that you have to have flexibility and have the ability to have different experiences, as well as maintaining a fleet of cars. Um, of course, we're in Texas. I'm sure the gas prices here are much, much lower than the rest of the country. But for those of us who live with $4 gasoline, I think we all understand the, the price of that. So with that, I wanted to spend some time today uh, really talking about, uh, really providing you a little insight of a recent report 
uh, that locus in conjunction with the George Washington University Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis. Uh, we conducted it in 2014 and released it at the uh, 2014 Locus Leadership Summit. And in this report, we basically said, and I kind of, let me get, take a step back. Uh, for the past three years, uh, Chris Leinberger and our team has been going to a variety of regions, uh, starting first in Washington, D.C., then moving to Atlanta. Uh, most recently, uh, conducted a report, uh, a walk-up walk -up urban report in Boston, where we basically went in and analyzed the entire landmass of the region, um, and then began to realize, ask the simple question, where is the market going? Um, so this past year, in 2014, we, we asked a simple question. Where is this country going? How is Atlanta comparing, comparing to D.C.? How is it comparing to Seattle? And so what we did was actually identify every walkable urban place in this country in the top 30 metro areas. And after identifying those walkable urban places, we then ranked those, uh, those, metro, those 30 metro areas um, based on their current and future demand for walkable urban places. So I think you're going to see over the next couple of slides some interesting data points that kind of goes and helps underscore why you're here today, to better understand the development, where the market is actually going. So with that, <clears throat> for 50 years we recognized the way we divided our metropolitan areas, uh, whether it's Dallas, Fort Worth, or Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Um, the way we divide our metropolitan areas have been in two, uh, two ways, urban and suburban. Of course, with the rise of walkable development, we had to begin to change our view of the world. And specifically, I like to uh, put out there that the way we should be looking at the way we build the built environment and our land use is between walkable urban and drivable suburban. With this view, uh, we can divide the metro area into four land use options. If it's in the walkable urban category, as you can see up top, uh, we have regionally significant and neighborhoods. If you're in a drivable suburban, you have edge cities and Bedouin communities. For our, the focus of our report, and I just want to go back here, the focus of our report was primarily on the regionally significant walkable urban places. We define that as being, uh, and for, for us, the regionally significant definition is basically a walkable urban place uh, that has at least 1.4 million square feet of office, at least 340 square feet in retail space, and a walk score of at least 70. Now, how many of you, by the show of hands, know walk score or are aware of walk score? Oh, perfect. I don't have to explain to you. Great. So with that definition, um, we went and surveyed across the country. And I also want to note um, that we, in this report, we only looked at, we only used office and retail space uh, to use for ranking our walkable urban places because what we found across the board uh, is that residential numbers were not consistent among all the cities. So we used office and retail space as a proxy for future development. So what did we learn from this report? First, we identified that this real estate cycle, there are over 558 walkable urban regionally significant places in the top 30 metro areas. Of those 30 metro areas, we began to rank their current and future walkable urban places based on high, medium, tentative, and low. The six highest metro areas today who are building the most walkable urban places may not surprise you. Washington, D.C. being number one. Number two, New York. Boston, number three. San Fran, Chicago, Seattle. They round out the top five or six. Dallas, can anyone guess where Dallas ranked out of 30? 27, someone said? Close, 25. One of the things that we recognize in our report, when we uh, analyzed the, the 30 metros, we found that uh, Walker Urban Places offers rents uh, achieved about 74% premium over their drivable suburban counterparts in each of those 30 uh, uh, large metro areas. So on average, that was about $35 per square foot uh, in a walkable urban place versus $20 per square foot in a drivable suburban place. 
Um, if, we, if you took out New York City, which we all know has a high, uh, very expensive uh, office and retail market, that average, that percentage went down to 44%. So that clearly, these rent premiums, uh, rent premiums of this magnitude truly reflect the pent up demand for walkable urban office and retail space. And we believe it's going to be the, um, the driver for our future development um, of walkable urban places. Um, I think across the country, we're seeing these price premiums. Uh, for example, if you look in Denver, you're seeing the walkable urban downtown cores are outpacing their uh, driveless suburban counterparts, which literally 10 years ago were in opposite directions. Uh, you've seen this in places like Seattle, as well as in Atlanta. Once again, we're constantly seeing that the price premiums and the price points of walkable urban places today in this current market are outperforming their driveless suburban places. Now, one of the things that I also want to note is that while it is true that the center, uh, the center cities are revitalizing, the true story that came out of our report is that this is much about the urbanization of the suburbs. For example, in Washington, D.C., we found, D.C. being the national leader, creating right now has 45 uh, walkable urban places projected to have about uh, 60 uh, by the next two real estate cycles, but 49% of its walkable urban places are actually located in the suburbs. So once again, this is not about the downtown cores, but it's truly about the urbanization of the suburbs. In addition, one of the things that we have to rec we recognize that what we found out in this report is that on average in much of the 30 metros that we surveyed, the walkable urban places only accounted for 1% of the total land mass, 1%. So the fact of the matter is that as, as we begin to continue to build uh, walkable urban places, it's, only, it's not going to take over the entire land mass, but the fact of the matter is only 1%, and we know where that 1% is. Now, in other, other correlations and things I just want to point out is the fact that we learned that there's a significant correlation, but not causal link, to the fact that within walkable urban places, there was a higher percentage of the workforce with college, college degrees, as well as a higher GDP per capita. And one of the things that we note here is uh, <clears throat> if you took the top six uh, Walker urban places, it was as equivalent of comparing the United States economy, compare, and in the bottom six, uh, compare, uh, the bottom six GDP, it was almost comparing it to the United States economy to the uh, economy of like Romania. So the fact of the matter is, is that metropolitan areas that are driving towards and using walkable urban places as a development strategy, as an economic development strategy, are seeing great economic prosperity. Now, one of the things that we also did, as I said before, this is just of the current uh, real estate market. We also went and uh, uh, looked at what is the current future development. Where are the top 30 metros heading uh, moving forward? To determine this, we based uh, our future development um, on a directional index, uh, which consists of just basically analyzing office space absorption using a fair share index. Also, we looked at the total uh, metro share of walkable uh, urban places, office and retail location, as well as office rent premiums. And with that, we found some very interesting um, 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 changes. Of course, and it, uh, the number one in this case was Boston, who uh, in the next 10 years would be, uh, project, is projected to have about 60 to 65 walkable, uh, new walkable urban places uh, with DC coming. But one of the most significant aspects is the fact that places like Detroit, Atlanta, and Miami moved into the top 10. Um, and largely due to the fact that today they're making massive investment in transit, or, uh, transit as well as uh, other uh, infill uh, investments. Um, one of the things I also note here is that Dallas, uh, who was 25th today, uh, is projected to move up to number 17. Now, one of the things that we also recognize, um, I think, uh, Lee, you spoke it uh, uh, very well earlier, is that we have seen this trend towards walkable urbanism. We've seen it in our neighborhoods. Uh, we're seeing it in, in, in reflecting a lot of state policies um, in terms of trying to encourage it. One of the unintended consequences for this great uh, demand for walkable urban places is the fact that there is a major decrease in social equity. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we've been, uh, one of the things we've been uh, really trying to champion for the past two years is the fact that we have to be better managers and plan better for affordability, uh, not just for housing, 
but also for commercial and manufacturing, which is really critical to maintain uh, 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 the, the prospect of walkable urban places. I think one of the things I'll lastly say on this point is that as we are beginning to see a lot of the efforts that CNU and Locus and Smart Group America and other organizations have been doing to promote walkable infill development, uh, we cannot become victims of our own success. So, in closing, uh, what, do we, what do we learn? Uh, this report basically indicated that the metros uh, found to have high walkable urban places are clearly leading the model for future development, uh, many across all the 30 metros. Every 30, all the metros are uh, figuring out ways to develop new walkable urban places. Uh, the trend also suggests that future de development and demand for tens of millions of square feet for walkable urban new, uh, new places uh, cannot be realized in this real estate cycle or even in this generation. Um, one of our future-oriented metrics also showed that you know, places like Miami, places like Atlanta and Los Angeles are critically, are making significant and unexpected shifts towards walk of urban demand. And I think more, more, moral of the story is the fact that as we are seeing this uh, major demand come upon us, uh, we know that walk of urbanism is the market now and it's great. So with that, um, I say thank you and I look forward to uh, the further conversation. Lee? All right. Well, thanks, Christopher. That was great. Um, Christopher actually perfectly queued up the discussion that I'm going to talk about. Um, so my name is Jillian Sutherland, I'm a project manager with a nonprofit organization called the Sonoran Institute. Um, can I just see a raise of hands if you've heard of the Sonoran Institute before? Oh, yeah, okay, well, that's pretty good. Um, so for those of us who, who don't know what the Sonoran Institute is, we are a nonprofit organization that works across the North American West. And what we do is, is help Western communities deal with issues that are related to growth and change. And so we are located across the North American West, um, but as Lee said, I work for the Rocky Mountain Program, so I'm located in Colorado, and I work for one of, uh, one of the initiatives that we do called the Community Builders Initiative. And Community Builders was, was created to help communities in Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Montana really effectively approach their community and economic development strategies going forward. And so, you know, today we've been talking a lot about um, urban places, right? So if you look at this, this map up here, they're the bright places, those metropolitan areas that Christopher was talking about. And we know that market preferences have changed there. We know that a demand for walkable uh, development is strong in those places. But what about the region that the Sonoran Institute works in, you know, the West? You can see the stark contrast between that region and the regions that we've been talking about. You know, you can see very clearly where a lot of economic activity is happening in our nation. Um, and communities that I work with are often very rural in nature, and we are typically really reliant on either energy extraction, tourism, or resort-type development um, economies. And so these communities really do um, become affected by boom and bust cycles. You know, when the nation is doing well economically, these communities are doing well economically. You know, people are buying second homes, third homes, a lot of construction is happening. But when the nation's economy is not doing well, a lot of those jobs just disappear overnight in this region. And so what we do at Community Builders is we help uh, these communities really look at how they can build resilient economies that aren't dependent on this boom and bust cycle. And so a part of that is really understanding how these communities can attract and retain talent, you know, so that millennials do want to come to our communities and diversify our economies. And the communities that we work with are really grappling with that issue. And I think that one of the main things that they're considering these days is, is how they attract and retain that talent. So is the shifting market that we see happening nationally really happening, you know, in these Western communities? Because they are very, very quite different. You know, are people looking for that walkable urban development that we're seeing at a national scale? So we've been paying attention to the National Association of Realtors Community Preference Surveys, you know, the one that came out in 2011, the one came, that came out in 2013, that was really showing that people were willing to make trade-offs to live in walkable urban development. And so we wanted to ask that question um, in, in our region. And so 
In 2013, we released a report called Reset. And so what we did was we mirrored the questions that were asked in that community preference survey. And we asked it of residents across Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, and Idaho to see if those trends are in fact happening in our region as well. We followed up that study with the place value study, and now that isn't even fully published yet, but I'm gonna share with you some of the findings from that. We were wondering through place value, you know, if, if people are looking for walkable urban development, is that also affecting where businesses are choosing to locate and where people are locating? So I'm gonna start my conversation by focusing on place value a little bit. So we surveyed, we had almost a thousand respondents of both, we, we surveyed both businesses and also just residents to ask them about why they chose to locate, locate where they did. And so we had three key findings. The first one is that jobs follow people. So this is very much in, uh, in relationship to what Christopher was talking about, about how these days people really are looking for the community that they wanna be in first before they find the job. Not, people aren't following um, jobs in the way that they used to. People, of course, are also, they're drawn to great places. They want to live in communities that are authentic and have a lot going on. And also, people who are on the move, who are relocating, they're looking for that place, you know, before they're looking for that job. So let me delve into some of the numbers there. So in our survey that we did as a part of the place value study, what we found was that 39% of the respondents said that when they were making their relocation decision, the community was more important to them than the job. You know, 44% said that they considered both equally, but it's very interesting that only 17% said that the job was most important in that relocation decision. Furthermore, we asked people to say, um, to choose, would they sacrifice salary or the ideal community when they were choosing where to locate. Only 17% of our respondents said that they would take the higher salary over the ideal community. So that's 83% of our respondents said that the ideal community was more important to them than money. I mean, that's a really big deal. So it makes us ask the question, you know, what, do, what does make the place great? What are people really actually looking for? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our reset study and to give you some of the results of that. Now, I'm not up here to tell you that people in the West are, they're only looking for condos downtown. You know, everybody wants to live in a loft. It's not true. You know, most people did say that they still want to live in a detached single family home. And this is also consistent with the National Association of Realtors findings. 88% um, of our respondents said that they, you know, they prefer to live in a single family home. But we've got to take that a little bit with a grain of salt because when we dug into the question a little bit deeper, what we found was that people said, 60% of respondents said, that the most important uh, factor in deciding where to live, you know, when they're choosing a home, is location. Only 3% of our respondents said that it was the housing type or the design that was the most important. So it's kind of funny that 88% say they want a single family home, but 60% say that location is the most important factor. It's, it's pretty interesting. Character and sense of place was also really important to the folks that responded to both of our studies, both reset and place value. 89% of our respondents said that they prioritized the neighborhood character over the home size. And we also saw that reflected in a place value findings. It was a priority factor, you know, the, the, the neighborhood character in deciding whether or not they were gonna locate or remain in a community. Walkability was hugely important. Reset showed us that 90% of our respondents said that living within walking distance of other things in the community was an important factor in their housing decision. Convenience and access to amenities. People said that they were willing, 58% of respondents said that they were willing to live in a smaller house on a smaller lot if they were able to walk to amenities, walk to shopping, walk to work, walk to school. And 42% said, you know, I'll drive to those things if, I, if it means I can live in a larger house. So it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, the majority said they would take a smaller house on a smaller lot. Access to open space and recreation is really important to people in our region. It's why a lot of folks move out west. They want to be in the mountains. They want to be on the trails. They want to be on the ski hill. 62% said that they would live in a house that was closer together on a smaller lot if they could walk to recreation. What I want to focus the rest of my discussion on is the downtown premium. You know, that's where we really see walkable urban development in our small communities in the West, are in our historic downtowns. 
So 63% of our respondents in the reset study said that they would own or rent a detached single family house even if it meant that they had to drive downtown. So the majority did say that they still want that single family house above you know, being able to walk to downtown. But that still left 37%. 37% said that they would live in a townhouse or a condo, you know, if it meant that they could walk downtown. And that's a really important portion of the market. That's more than a third of respondents. And we don't have that product in the West right now. And that's what I really want to highlight, you know, for the rest of my discussion. And I thought I would use an illustration um, from my own experience. So I live in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. It is three hours west of Denver, so we're right in the mountains, we're smack in the middle of Aspen and Vail, but it's pretty much a, a working class community. And I wanted to show you some examples that are on the market right now in Glenwood Springs. So this is a downtown home. Um, this is where it is located. It is two blocks from our Amtrak station that can take you across the nation. It's right in the downtown core where all of the jobs are in Glenwood Springs and a lot of the amenities. And so that house that I was showing you, let me see if I can go back, that's listed for $399,000. It's $290 a square foot. It's two bedrooms and it's one bathroom, okay? But it's a great, great location and it just sold. And just to show you a comparison, another house that's on the market, you can see where that star is. It's, it's on the outskirts of Glenwood Springs. You've got to drive everywhere if you live out there. There aren't really trails close by. You know, you can't get to the downtown core unless you drive, you know, conveniently. You could do it dangerously, I suppose. This is also listed for $399,000. It's $190 a square foot, okay? This is four bedrooms, four bathrooms. This is still on the market. So I just wanted to show you a contract. I mean, a takeaway from that is that people are willing to pay a lot of money to live in Glenwood Springs. <laughs> so people do want to be there because housing is quite expensive. But it just shows you that downtown premium. It's, it's really amazing. And I think it's because we don't have that, a lot of that product in our downtown areas. And people really want it. This is really important to the economic development of our Western communities because in our place value study, 68% of the community members that we surveyed said that their community lacks sufficient housing choices. It doesn't offer the kind of housing choices that they're really after, okay? 60% of the employers that we surveyed said that the cost of housing in their community impacts their ability to attract employees, okay? So that really affects their ability to grow and expand their business, and that's what we all want to see our businesses do, right? But they can't do it because the housing product just isn't there. So how do we respond? I thought I'd talk a little bit about our work in Grand Junction, Colorado, um, just to give you an illustration of a community that's trying to do everything it can you know, to, to attract more of this walkable urban development. Grand Junction, for those of you that don't know, it's kind of in the middle of Salt Lake City in Denver. It's the biggest metropolitan area on the western slope of Colorado. It's where I go for medical services. Lots of people on the western slope go there. Um, and it's about 60,000 people in population. It's about the same size as like a Bozeman or a Missoula, if you're more familiar with those areas. This is their historic downtown. This, this is a picture actually, I believe, taken from the 1960s when they did a road diet way back then and they, they necked down a five-lane Main Street into two lanes, you know, because they wanted to make a really attractive downtown, which is wonderful. It's great, you know. Um, but this is the kind of the development that you see right now. I took this picture about a year ago in Grand Junction. You know, it's, it's the same kind of stuff that we see in a lot of places. They're single-family homes on larger lots, this is way, way far away from the downtown. I mean, you'd have to drive everywhere if you lived there, and that's evident by, I mean, you can see it's in the middle of nowhere by that picture. So we did a survey of over 1,000 people in Grand Junction to see if there was a demand in Grand Junction for walkable development. And 42% of those folks who responded said that they were interested in living in the greater downtown area if the opportunity was there. And we also saw that in some of the market trends that we examined in, in downtown Grand Junction. In just between 2012 and 2013, the number of sales jumped dramatically in the downtown district. Only three had sold, I think, the year before that, and then it jumped in 2012, and then it jumped up to 45. So that was a 1,400% increase. And the, the price per unit was rising, and also the price per square foot was, was, was pretty healthily rising. So Grand Junction wants to respond by increasing their housing choices. They want to make sure that there's more housing available in the core area. And um, so what they did is they started identifying infill sites you know, for that housing development. They want to prove that that market is there further by providing more housing in the downtown. 
So this is a lot that the Downtown Development Authority owns in Grand Junction, and they are pursuing a public-private partnership to recreate this lot into 43 market rate rental units. To What they want to do is they want to demonstrate to the private sector that people actually do want to be in downtown Grand Junction. And since we've done this study, they do have an, a developer that's interested. So we will see you know, if they build the new housing, will they actually come? But I think that that's where a lot of our communities in the West are right now. They're seeing these trends, but because we, we haven't seen that kind of development, um, communities are really looking for some demonstration projects to show. And so this is just a rendering of what they're hoping to achieve on that lot. Um, so for further information, if you want to read more about our studies, uh, there's lots more to read in these studies. Place value is not out in full yet, but some of the information is on our communitybuilders.net site. And Reset is available there to download in full. Um, so I invite you to do that. So thank you very much. So everybody's way taller than I am. <laughs> so, well, thanks, everybody. And I think we've really teed up an interesting conversation because I'm going to take us down a similar but a little different path. I'm Jean Anthony, and I work with AARP, an organization I hope you're all familiar with. But if you're not, we are a nonprofit social mission organization with a membership estimated at around 37 million, representing the needs of the 50 plus. And we really focus a lot of our work at several different levels, one of which is at the state and local level, um, where we undertake a lot of the work around livable communities. And I'm very fortunate to have some of my colleagues from AARP Texas in the room with us. And so if you live in Dallas or you live in Fort Worth and you want to join us in the work that we're doing, I'd really love to be able to introduce you. So AARP, as I mentioned, is a social mission organization, and we focus on livable communities as one of the areas of work that we do. And this is the definition that we employ when we think about livable communities. And it's probably pretty consistent with the definition that you all think of, too. It's affordable and appropriate housing, supportive community services, adequate mobility options, but for us, it also is very important that it facilitate the personal independence and the continued engagement of the 50 plus population within their community. And so there really is a little bit of a different twist when we think about what that livable community needs to look like. The other thing is, you know, why is this really important to us? Um, it's been mentioned um, here today already in many conversations that you've probably had that we've really entered into an era of profound demographic change in our country. Uh, the boomers are turning 65 at a rate of about 10,000 uh, per year. And by the time we get to um, in 2030, there'll be twice as many people who are 65 and older. In fact, there'll be far more people who are 65 and older than there will be 15 and under. So it's really important when we think about the work that we're doing that we take this older population in mind, keep this older population in mind. So I mentioned um, that we are really an aging uh, population and an aging country. And so I know a lot of you are thinking, well, yeah, but we've got these millennials and they're all so young. Well, the fact is they also aspire to be old. And when we get to 2050, those millennials will be my members. So I think we really need to keep in uh, mind the fact that the work that we're really doing today that represents the needs for more walkable and livable communities for our older residents is really designed for the future to support the needs of the millennial generation that you've heard so much about already today. Little fun fact that I like to share is that we have, we think, maybe 65,000 members who are over 100 right now. So imagine that, that they're still active and they want to, to be able to get around. So we do a lot of research as well, and we speak with members, and we speak with uh, generally the 45 plus. And what they tell us and have told us for years is that they want to stay in their homes as they get older. And this is really important as we think about the work that we want to undertake. But one of the things that I'd like to point out is that 
Many of the homes that they live in currently were designed for able-bodied 35-year-olds, which they no longer are. In fact, and Jillian made a reference to the preference for single-family homes, uh, recently AARP and Harvard uh, released a study talking about home ownership and found that the vast majority of the older population does in fact live in a single-family home. And so this really begins to impact the work that we think about in terms of housing. And I know I attended a session, um, I, I, I think it was yesterday, um, possibly it was Wednesday, about um, the different types of housing that we need to think about, and that is that the vast majority of the housing stock, um, particularly in, um, in the suburban and the more rural areas, is that single family home. So when we think about the fact that many of our members say that not only do they want to stay in their homes, but they also want to stay in their communities, we need to recognize that they're living in single family homes and they don't have a vast number of options to think about where they might want to move. And so a lot of the work that we do is thinking about how these communities can be retrofitted to ensure that they can stay in the communities because they say that's where they raise their family, that's where their friends are, their faith-based communities are there, they're accustomed to the services. But we also recognize that transportation is an issue because we all will, for the most part, outlive our driving years, and yet in the country, we have not really designed communities that can support non-drivers. And it's interesting, I had a conversation with Lynn Richards about this and she reminded me that it's not just the older population that doesn't drive, but it's anybody under 16 and in fact some of those millennials that we're talking about that don't want to drive. So we're really talking about, um, you know, prohibiting or being prohibitive for many folks being able to get around their community if they're not able to drive. So, in addition to asking if they want to stay in their homes or their communities, we ask what's important that you have near your home. And I just want to point out a couple of the, the responses here. The first one is the bus stop, that 50% of the respondents to a survey we conducted indicated that it was important that a bus stop be within one mile or less of their home. And if you drop down on that chart, you'll also notice that 23% said that they wanted a train or a subway. And so in my in my mind, that suggests that about 73% are saying they need transportation options close to where they live in order to be able to get around their community, to get to work, to get to the services they would like, to the entertainment they enjoy. So I'm not going to dwell on this one um, because many of you are familiar with the, the National Association of Realtors. Um, but uh, a survey, uh, Julian referenced it, it's been referenced in other presentations while we've been here. But suffice it to say that there is a trade-off that folks of all ages are willing to make in order to have a more walkable community. Uh, another one that was recently released by the American Planning Association really had a lot of responses from active boomers. And so, again, this just reinforces the desire for boomers to have that walkable community. But I want you to look at the top one because what it says is whether it's an urban, suburban, or small town location. Now we talk a lot about urban locations and we know that the trend is for people to move into the cities both in our country and across the world. But the fact of the matter is about 50% still live in suburban or rural areas. And so when we think about this work, much like Jillian has suggested, we really need to think about how we can improve that urban walkability, those characteristics, but to do it in suburban areas and in rural areas. Because if you think back to that other statistic that I showed you, many of the 45 plus say they don't want to leave where they're currently living. So we have an obligation to think about how we make these areas more walkable and how we improve the types of housing to ensure that it's affordable and accessible for folks as they age. Now, there's another, um, another issue that I think is really important, and Christopher certainly talked about it, and Jillian um, referenced, and that's the economic development piece. 
And much attention has really been uh, spent in this country and given to the cost of supporting older and less active population. But in reality, the challenge is for the U.S. economy to determine how to make the most of a growing over 50 uh, population, many of whom are reaching peak productivity. Older Americans are a vibrant group. They're driven to keep working and contributing to the economy either through a financial need or simply because they want to uh, stay active and feel fulfilled. Their growing presence will be not only a net gain for the overall American economy, but also a crucial opportunity for businesses. So when we were thinking about this and trying to build the case, because frequently folks don't want to talk about the older population, they want to focus, as many of us do in this country, on the youth, not a bad place to focus, but let's not forget and lose sight of this older population, we decided to take a look at the contribution that the 50 plus make to the GDP. In 2012, you'll note that 46% was contributed by what we call the longevity economy. And what that is is defined as the sum of all economic activity serving the needs of Americans over 50. But you'll note in the other side of the chart that in 2032, the expectation is that it will be over 50%. This is not chump change, folks. This is a lot of money that the boomers and the older population have to spend, and they do spend it. They're also staying in the workforce longer, and in fact, they're launching businesses at a rate two times that of the millennials. So I just want to reemphasize the value, both from um, a historical, civic, social engagement perspective, but also from a financial and economic perspective that the older population uh, presents to this country. And so this chart we won't dwell on, but you can see the contribution that wages and salaries for uh, the longevity economy makes to the U.S. GDP, as well as the taxes that are, that are collected um, from that same segment. And I mentioned the fact that there is an aging workforce <clears throat> Excuse me. And what this. <coughs> Sorry. What this chart demonstrates is really how long and how old folks will be um, in the workforce, right? So if you look at 2020, you'll see that 35% of men and 28% of women aged 65 to 74 will still be working. And again, I don't want to position this as an either-or situation. I think we all know that, um, that when folks are working and contributing to the, the economy, you know, either through salaries being spent or taxes being paid, that that fuels economic growth and it really bolsters, um, I guess, all boats rise, right? So um, other, fo other jobs are created based on that. But I do want to make the argument and help you understand the value that older Americans play and that when they talk and when we talk about their wants and needs and when they share their wants and needs with us, we hope that you'll understand that that's an important uh, want and need to consider as you undertake your work. So what is some of the work that we really do at AARP to support our members and to think about the livable community um, issue area? Um, the the first way we work is through um, educating and influencing elected officials, folks such as yourselves, and others who are working in the livable community issue area. And our hope is that they will enact changes that will really support um, the 50 plus residents within their community as they get older so that they can remain engaged and so that they can age gracefully and stay in the homes that they like. In addition to staff, we have volunteers, a very significant volunteer cadre, who love their homes and their communities and support the work that we do. In fact, we have one of the key volunteers from the Dallas area here with us as well today. So the first um, program that I'd like to mention is the AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities. This is our really, it's our most comprehensive platform for engaging leaders to improve their community's quality of life for residents, and it employs a strategic framework which is referred to as the eight domains. But we launched this network in 2012 with eight communities, and in that time we've grown to um, over 50, representing 30 million residents. 
Now, Jillian, you'll notice that I'm missing some communities in some of your key states, so we need to put our heads together on how we can um, enroll some of the communities in the network. And if any of you are from states that you don't see a star in, see me after this meeting. We have some talking to do. So. Um, we are the institutional affiliate for the World Health Organization here in the U.S., and as such, we uh, manage the network, we produce resources, we enroll communities, we have state staff working with all of these communities across the country to help them build out um, their approach to improving the livability and the age-friendliness of their communities. So as I mentioned, there's a strategic framework that's employed when this work is undertaken in the communities. And it really divides into two key areas that you're pretty familiar with, the built environment being one addresses outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation and housing, and then the social environment, which is absolutely key. There's um, one of the leading cause or indicators of premature death is isolation. And so having folks stay engaged in their community and uh, contributing to it is really important. And so ensuring that um, that, that is possible, not only for um, the elder population, but for for all segments of the population is really key. And of course, we heard this morning the real need for us to explore greater inclusion of diverse groups within our communities as we undertake this work. So the next uh, program that we undertake in communities around the country is uh, offering technical assistance. And this is through our Active Living Workshop program. We uh, partner with the Walkable and Livable Communities Institute to undertake this work. And we find that this program really serves as a catalyst to uh, introduce communities to what the livable community work is and how they can begin to think differently about developing, improving, and uh, retrofitting their community. Um, and when we think about how to engage volunteers and how to really open people's eyes, one of the easiest ways to do that is through community walk audits. It's really amazing what happens to individuals when they are no longer in their vehicle speeding through the downtown, but they're actually walking on the sidewalk if it exists or in the street if it doesn't. And they begin to understand that sidewalk to nowhere, while funny when you see it on a slide, not so funny if you're walking with a mobility device or you're pushing a stroller um, with your, your, you know, your infant in it. And so we have used this, uh, this program and this strategy to really open eyes and to really help um, institute complete streets policies in communities around the country. And we also um, use it as a way for volunteers to really begin to get engaged in the community. Now, I mentioned the fact that many of our um, members still live in single-family homes that are designed for able-bodied 35-year-olds. Uh, we have a program that's designed to help people understand how to modify those homes. It's called HomeFit. Uh, this is something that is uh, provided through workshops in states around the country, supported by AARP staff, as well as the American Association for Occupational Therapists. It's also information that's available for folks to download and do a, sort of a self-study. Um, the low-cost, no-cost, is really designed to help them understand some really key things to improve um, the safety and security and allow them to live comfortably in their homes. And then this is really big. This is the most recent resource that we uh, launched. It was launched April 20th at the American Planners Association, and it's called the AARP Livability Index. This index has been in the works for a couple of years, and our Public Policy Institute really uh, managed the development of this project. And in essence, you can put your street address or you can put your zip code in, and it will give you a composite score of how livable your community is. And that composite score is made up of underlying scores that address things such as housing, transportation, neighborhood, social equity, uh, environmental quality, and so forth. All of the metrics that are employed in developing these scores are um, valid, valuable, they're 
produced by the EPA, they're produced by the U.S. Census, they're produced by other reputable organizations, um, and we will update them on a regular basis. But what's really important from our perspective is while this addresses the needs of all residents in the community, it also includes our policy positions relative to the 50 plus. So if you live in a community where there is a complete streets policy in place, your community gets a bump, a positive bump. If you live in a community that has universal design ordinances in place, you'll get a bump, and so on. But the other thing that is really important is that um, if you happen to want to investigate a community because some folks, as we've learned, uh, choose place before they choose jobs, if you want to take a look at a community, you can use it to do that. If you happen to be a multimillionaire and housing affordability and accessibility is not an issue for you, you can change the weight of that domain within the context of the, of the index. So my hope is that you all are pulling your iPads out right now and going to aarp.org slash livability index and putting in your street address to learn how livable your community is. And when you see, and you will, that most of them average in the 50 range, you'll begin to think about what needs to be done within your community to improve the livability. So just a quick mention of other resources are uh, aarp.org slash livable. We have a newsletter. We'd love for you all to sign up to, um, to get that. We announce all our new resources there. We do best practices, case studies, interviews with key um, practitioners within the, er the issue area of livable communities. So I think that's it. Thank you. So we do have time for questions. Um, I'm going to take the first one. Um, one of the observations I made about all three presentations with regard to demand for walkable communities was the role of transportation. Um, it was it seemed to not be factored as much in the metrics as commercial and 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 was for the sort of static look at the 30 metropolitan areas. But as you reevaluated the future status. It seemed as if transit-oriented development played a large factor in how you graded or weighted a community's future outlook. And, um, you know, Jillian, you also, in, as a proxy, sort of used location, location, location in your presentation with access and proximity as a, as a way to create value in downtown versus a house that couldn't sell. And then, Gene, you had mentioned um, transportation and mobility being one of the third stools of, your, uh, of what older Americans want. And, and the statistics that older Americans who live far away would like a bus stop or a train or subway stop. So I think what I took away was the underlying value for, when we talk about demand for walkable places, is the real value of transportation in creating these places. So one of the things I, I would like to ask is if you could briefly, maybe the three of you just take on, what does this mean for either cities or places that aren't investing in transportation or in for um, communities that don't have it. What is to become of those people and those American places that are not getting demands of transportation met? And I was just wondering if your thoughts on that. So can you say the last part? Just, uh, what, what's happening in terms of, what's happening to these communities? How are, how are the people in those towns who have property and equity um, and social networks but can't get the transportation they need to be a part of a walkable place? How are you, within your work, dealing with those type of transportation issues to maybe satisfy that or correct that? So I can respond to that. Um, so we actually have a program that is just focused on transportation issues. It's called New Mobility West. And so, so that program, you can go to newmobilitywest.org if you really want to dig into it. But what we do is, is we're helping communities that are grappling with that exact question. So, you know, they're seeing these trends change and they're seeing that people want to have mobility options, but how do these communities in the West really meet, meet that, you know, meet that demand? I think that communities are beginning to understand and we're really trying to beat that drum now that their public investments and their infrastructure is really going to dictate the kind of development that they're going to get going forward. And so, um, so we offer technical assistance communities that are dealing with that issue. And I think that a lot of times these Western communities 
you know, oftentimes their main street is also a state highway, and so these communities really need to advocate for those highways to be the kind of main street that they want that fosters multi multimodal um, options. And so we help them, you know, kind of grapple with their DOTs to meet in the middle and make sure that those accommodations are there so that they're sort of setting the table for walkable urban development to happen. Because if that streetscape is really wide and the cars are going really fast, you're just gonna see the drive-throughs coming through, you know, you're going to see the big parking lots and the really car-oriented development. Um, and so we have that program to help communities learn how they can more strategically make those public investments to set the table for the private development. Um, I just want to echo, uh, we totally agree. One of the things we did that came out of our report was the fact that for the current 